quantum mechanics has changed our view of reality. This is why physicists talk so much about it. It's difficult to wrap your head around just how fundamentally quantum mechanics has unsettled our understanding of the world. Today I want to tell you just what makes it so hard to reconcile quantum physics with reality as we know and like it. The first reason is that quantum mechanics says small particles can do things that we never see everyday objects do. This makes quantum reality very strange indeed. To see why, remember that in quantum mechanics everything is described by a wave function, but only if the wave function solves an equation called the Schrodinger equation. This is how quantum physics works. If you want to, say, find out what a particle does, you need to solve the Schrodinger equation to calculate what the wave function does. In the simplest case, it says something like the particle goes this way or that way. But here's the weird thing. The Schrodinger equation is linear. This means that any sum of solutions is also a solution. As a consequence, if a particle can go this way and the particle can go that way, then the particle can also go this way plus that way. And what's that? It's called a superposition and we often say that the particle goes both directions at once. But is that really what happens? We have the maths, but we don't have the words. Another odd thing about quantum physics is that particles behave nothing like how we expect particles to behave. If you, for example, have a particle, a single particle, not a bunch of them, and you put it into the middle of a box, then the wave function of the particle runs apart. It'll smear out. It just doesn't stay there. In extreme cases, if you have a particle that traveled through half the universe, say from some supernova explosion to us, it might have smeared out to hundreds of millions of light years in diameter. Yet, when we measure the particle, it's suddenly in our detector. And if a particle is bound by some interaction, it'll form patterns, not zip around like a little ball. The best known example are electrons that form shells around an atomic nucleus. Those shells is also not a good word. It's rather that they're clouds in different symmetry configurations. And these are just some of the reasons for why quantum physics is difficult to reconcile with our everyday experiences. We just don't expect things to behave this way. Then again, one could say, okay, but that small particles don't behave like pigeons doesn't change our conception of reality. Fair enough. But this was only the first layer of weirdness. The second layer of weirdness of quantum physics is the lack of definite properties. That something is definite means it's either so or it isn't. There's no ambiguity about it. And we normally think that objects, things, have definite properties whether or not anyone cares to figure out what they are. You either have an apple tree in the garden or not, regardless of whether you recently checked on it. But in quantum physics, that isn't so. The best example is a particle that's in several places at once until you look and measure its position. Then it's suddenly in one place. Think again of that particle that came from the supernova and spread out to a billion light years or so. How does this suddenly fit into a detector? Physicists typically resolve this problem the way that Bohr approached it by saying that it makes no sense to ask where the particle really was before you measured it. And that's easy enough to say, but what does it mean to have a particle that isn't really anywhere? It's one thing to do the calculation, it's another thing entirely to make sense of it. If you were thinking that you can make peace with quantum physics because it's just about small things that we can't see with our own eyes, you won't get away that easily. 
Erwin Schrödinger came up with his thought experiment about the dead and alive cat to illustrate exactly that. You can take the weird behavior of tiny particles and amplify it to macroscopic size. In Schrödinger's example, an atom that both decays and doesn't decay both releases a toxic gas and doesn't release it and that both kills the cat and doesn't kill it. This means that if you believe the mathematics of quantum physics, then before you make a measurement, dead and alive cats also need to exist. Clearly we don't observe that, but why? Physicists' go-to answer is to say that, well, the cat is in some sense constantly being measured by air molecules and quanta of light and so on. And this is a superficially plausible story, but really all you get this way is a cat that's 50% dead and 50% alive, which isn't something we observe either. In somewhat more technical terms, what I'm saying is that decoherence doesn't turn superpositions into definite states, it turns them into probability distributions. Another way out of the Schrödinger cat conundrum comes from the many worlds interpretation and has it that the cat's alive in one universe and dead in another one. But I'm not sure if this is any better than a dead and alive cat. But wait! That wasn't it. There's another deeper level in the rabbit hole, which is the problem that quantum mechanics seems to be inconsistent with the idea that there is only one reality that we all agree upon. This was the point of a proof by Frauchinger and Renner that widely made headlines as showing that reality doesn't exist. Their argument uses a version of Wigner's friend, which is based on the same problem that Schrödinger's cat illustrates. It's that in quantum mechanics, until you make a measurement, a state can be in a superposition and that includes potentially living beings. So suppose you have a friend who's in the laboratory and they make a measurement on a particle that's in two places at once, a superposition of places. Once they measure the particle, it's either left or right. But if you're standing in front of the door, it seems that your friend is now in a superposition one in which the particle's right and your friend measured it right, plus the particle being left and your friend measuring it left, until you open the door and find out what your friend measured. Frauchinger and Renner then showed that if you take two of these friends with their labs and two paper outside of the doors, then there are cases where it's impossible for all four to agree on what they've measured. That just wouldn't agree with the predictions of quantum physics. This is quite something, because it means that there isn't such a thing as objective reality in the sense that it can't be independent of us, the observer. However, as I explained in an earlier video, this problem has a simple resolution, is that you treat a measurement as a physical process that either happens or doesn't happen. I'm not sure why physicists don't like my explanation. I think that's what sanity requires. Personally, I think the biggest lesson that quantum physics gives us about reality is one that you basically never hear about. It's that we can't measure the entire wave function. And yet, we need the wave function to correctly calculate what happens. That's to say, if you think that the wave function describes what really goes on, then we can't find out what really goes on. It's impossible. This is because the wave function is complex valued, so it can take on values that are complex numbers. But we can only ever measure a set of real numbers that describe it. In the best case, this accounts for about half the total information in the wave function. And this is entirely independent of just exactly how you make the measurement. It doesn't matter how clever you are, you cannot completely figure out what the wave function is. It's like there is part of reality that's in some fundamental sense hidden from us. I find this eternally fascinating. Physicists often joke that quantum physics is really just linear algebra. And you know, it's true. 
If you want to know more about how quantum physics really works, I recommend you have a look at Brilliant. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. What you see here is from their newly updated maths courses. No matter how abstract the topic seems, Brilliant's courses have intuitive visualizations that really click into my brain. And Brilliant covers a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses, just what I'm interested in. And they're adding new courses each month. And of course I have a special offer for viewers of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabine or scan the QR code, you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.